Good afternoon. My name is uh, Asher Kaufman and I'm the director of the Kroc Institute for International uh, Peace Studies. Today's event is the culmination of a month-long virtual event series uh, titled Mediating Justice, a Law, Ethnography and uh, Violence. And this uh, series was created by uh, Julia Kowalski, Assistant Professor of Global Affairs at the Kiel School of Global Affairs here at Notre Dame and a Kroc uh, faculty fellow and her colleague, Catherine Martino, Assistant Professor of Asian Studies at uh, Binghamton uh, University. Julia and Catherine reached out to us at uh, Croc uh, with the idea of launching a, a series that would focus on anthropology, justice, law, and uh, violence. That meeting uh, took place in, uh, back in July when we were coping with uh, uh, this new reality of a virtual world in which we all moved to following uh, COVID. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, to see that we were able to support this initiative and make uh, this uh, series uh, happen. Uh, the Medi Mediating Justice uh, series has brought together anthropologists and peace studies scholars to discuss how conditions, institutions, and interactions mediate ideas of uh, justice. The six previous uh, video dialogues in this series are available uh, uh, on Croc's uh, website. And I encourage you all to go to our website and listen to these uh, very intriguing, interesting uh, conversations on these uh, topics. Uh, inspired by recent events, such as systemic inequalities exposed by COVID-19 deaths and the widespread social mobilization against the uh, racist police violence, this series has sought to expand our understanding of how justice works beyond its use as a universal concept through interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, dialogue. Before we begin, uh, we would like to recognize that today's conversation about uh, justice is organized upon the lands of uh, native peoples. The University of Notre Dame resides on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Miami, Miami Peoria, and particularly the Pokagan, Pokagan uh, Potomat, Potawatomi, who played the uh, a key role in the establishment of uh, the University of Notre Dame and who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. The event today is moderated by uh, Dr. Dr. Catherine Bolton. Dr. Bolton, Cat, uh, is the author of uh, two books, uh, I Did It to Save My Life, Life and Survival in Sierra Leone, and more recently, uh, from a year ago, Serious Youth in Sierra Leone and an Ethnography of Performance and Global Connections. Uh, Dr. Bolton has also published multiple peer reviewed articles on a host of uh, topics from agriculture to youth, Ebola, and uh, the environment, just to mention a few. In the past year, she has been focusing on structural conditions that have uh, exacerbated the effect of COVID 19 on vulnerable and marginalized uh, uh, communities. Uh, Dr. Bolton, the floor is yours, uh, please. Thank you so much, Asher. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kamari Clark to you all today. Um, professor Clark is a distinguished professor at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the Center for Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. And she's currently on leave from the University of California, Los Angeles. Over her career, she has taught at Carleton University, the University of Pennsylvania, and Yale University. Professor Clark received her PhD in anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, as well as a master in the study of law from Yale University. For over 25 years, Professor Clark has researched, published, and taught about the global circulation of justice, emergent transnational religious movements, international law movements, and how ethnography can help us understand these complex formulations of culture and power. Professor Clark's research has received significant funding from the Wenner Grand Foundation for Anthropological Research, the Open Society Foundation, National Science Foundation, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. She has published over 50 peer reviewed articles in her fields of expertise, including publications in journals in cultural anthropology, area studies of Africa and the African diaspora, comparative law and human rights. Professor Clark has also authored and edited numerous books addressing legal institutions, race, globalization, and ethnographic methods. 
Her early book, Fictions of Justice, addressed the limits of legal pluralism for explaining how justice works differently across cultural contexts. Her most recent book, Effective Justice, The International Criminal Court and the Pan-Africanist Pushback, provides a groundbreaking theoretical framework for conceptualizing how globally circulating concepts of justice become real and deeply felt at local levels. Effective Justice received the 2019 Royal Anthropological Institute's Omri Talbot Book Prize and was also the 2019 finalist for the American Anthropological Associations for Africanist, Anthropo Africanist Anthropology Elliott P. Skinner Book Award Prize. Excuse me. Professor Clark's work has inspired and profoundly shaped this series, as those of you who've tuned in know. Her work shows us how the production of justice is an embodied emotional process and how this production happens through technocratic legal institutions, historical structures of power, mass media circulation, moral narratives, and social practices. She challenges us to think critically about how the circulation of images of, of perpetrators and victims slash survivors reflect and also erase histories of colonial violence and racialization. Her work helps us think precisely about the mediation of justice and in the process shows us not just how justice has come to be, but also how it is open to continual change. Professor Clark's work is essential for understanding our contemporary moment, both internationally and in the United States. We are delighted and honored to have Professor Clark with us here today. Now, the format of this is um, a little bit unusual because it involves everyone who's been part of the series thus far. Um, and those speakers are participants today um, in the Q&A session. So we are happy to be dis um, joined by them. We have our organizers, Dr. Julia Kowalski and Dr. Kate Martineau, as well as our dialogue participants, Dr. Will Garriott, Dr. Laura Kunruther, Dr. Mahan Mirza, Dr. Ann Mishi, Dr. Lori Nathan, and Ms. Alyssa Paler, who is a graduate student of Anthropology and Peace Studies. Unfortunately, the three of our series participants are unable to join us today, Dr. Justin DeLeon, Dr. Samin Mullah, and Dr. David Hooker. Um, but as it will be to you, the recording will be available to them afterward. So just a bit on the structure of this afternoon's event, um, Professor Clark will speak about her research for about 30 minutes. Um, and at that point, we will open it up for Q&A from the other participants in the series. And after that, we will invite you, the audience, to raise questions, which I ask you to do via the Zoom question and answer function in the chat box. Um, and I will be able to um, moderate and repeat your questions to Dr. Clark from there. And we aim to end at 5.10 p.m. And on that note, um, Dr. Clark, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you uh, for that introduction, Professor Bolton. Uh, and of course, thank you to the Kroc Institute, uh, especially Professor Asher Kaufman for uh, welcoming this series and in particular to Professors Gallagher and Martineau, uh, as well as uh, Julia Kowalski. Um, for their invitation and uh, their initiation. Uh, of course, thank you to the events coordinator for all of the work that has gone into this event, um, Lisa Gallagher, uh, much appreciated. And I'm sure that given that this is the culminating event, you're probably relieved as well that uh, an intensive month has uh, come to an end or has almost come to an end. Uh, so I'd like to start um, just by framing the, my talk for today in relation to effective justice and the international court. And what I'll do first is just share my screen. Um, see if this will work. Yep. Okay, so So in, in, in framing my talk, there are a couple of key components that, that are impor important. I don't have a lot of time, but what I'll do is just outline the core tenets of my the, the argument around effective justice and how we might think about justice in the contemporary moment. And if the optic is the international court and international criminal law as the assemblage, uh, then it's, it's worth reckoning with uh, the emergence of a court that for which genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression are part of the subject matter jurisdiction. But also relevant in, in thinking about the workings of international criminal justice in 
in this um, configuration is the reality that since 2002, the International Criminal Court has only indicted Africans. Um, and in, since between 2002 and 2018, 22 cases in nine set situations across only African states and the court had issued indictments for 39 individuals, so all Africans. And that in many ways sets, sets the context for thinking about what's at play and the work that I'm doing around these questions of how we understand justice and justice being also about how it looks, how it feels, um, and its manifestations in contemporary life. And so as part of my opening, I, I wanted to read a vignette that, that actually comes from the epilogue of my book, but in many ways has organized profoundly the, the ways that I approach these questions. Um, and I start with this vignette, which came from a young man from a prominent NGO. Um, this young man uh, experienced war in Sierra Leone and, and since that period has worked for this N NGO for, for many, many years. And, and so I'll, I'll quote uh, here. So we asked him what, what is his definition of, of justice and how has that conception transformed his life? And he responds and I quote, something that transformed the way I understood justice in my life, you ask? Well, in that book, there's a part where this young boy was running after this young girl for some money that someone had given them for helping to carry some luggage. The girl had escaped with this money and the guy was chasing her when this old woman stepped in to stop this fight. The old woman said, why do you do this? So the boy went through this explanation and at some point the old woman stopped and asked the young boy, where is your dad? And of course, this is taking shape in, in Sierra Leone in the context of West Africa. So she intervenes, uh, she wasn't buying the, the interpretation and I'll continue, where is your dad? And the young man said, my dad is dead. And the old woman said, how did he die? The young man explained that he was working in this industry and his hand was chopped off. And then they couldn't provide medical treatment for him. And then the woman said something to the young man, and this is what really influenced my life. And I'll, I'm continuing with the quote. Having gone through the conflict in Sierra Leone when I lost my dad. So the woman said to this young man, quote, the day you ask yourself why your dad died is the day you need to ask yourself why it was possible for him to die. And then ask yourself, what should I do that another will not die under such circumstances? And that is the day you will become a man." End of quote. Now, this story told by a prominent African civil society activist represents, of course, one person's take on what justice means. And what's clear here is justice apart from its judicialization, apart from its technocratic uh, formation, but but justice outside of the box. It emphasizes the pr perspective that the circumstances of structural adjustment, st structural injustice related to the death of the boy's father are not significant when it comes to understanding the relationship between justice narratives, the structures of plunder, the historical instability that fosters violence, and the moral and ethical regimes that shape the appropriateness of particular feeling rules uh, around which we might think about what justice is. And the, the components of these are what I call effective justice. So what is effective justice then? Effective justice is a term that I advance for understanding people's experiences of justice through embodied and always contingent and contested assemblages of practices. And so central to effects of justice is the notion that emotions are often dislodged, they're decoupled from lived places, lived experiences, and sometimes they're relocated to other domains. And they're relocated through a whole series of means um, that, that exist in our everyday interaction with each other, with the world. It involves an approach to um, 
to justice that continues the forms of sentimental expressions of justice, its representation, its feeling regimes, and unconscious spheres uh, that are manifest through material practices. Uh, one of the things that, that is quite important in, in this anthropology of justice is the idea that it's knowable through social and humanistic scholars through this materialized form, such as expressions of emotional sentiments. And it's this subjective experience of justice that involves the, a constellation of discourses, of narratives, of knowledge forms, signs, concepts, images, that are shaped by particular mor morally driven narratives used to constitute those victimized by violence, as well as to stop perpetrators or celebrate what, what some would see as, as freedom fighters. So the key argument is that contemporary international justice mobilizations do not actually gain their power through formalized lawmaking processes. And, and often what, what we see is this form of legal encapsulation in which there's a, a, an increasing role of law, an increasing role of judicialization in the ways that contemporary movements understand justice. We turn to the courts, we turn to the law. Uh, and part of what the, the argument here, what um, that structures my short conversation today is that these justice institutions like the International Criminal Court, ad hoc tribunals, et cetera, don't gain their power through these formalized lawmaking mechanisms. Instead, they actually gain their power through morally propelled and socio-politically propelled justice narratives that are brought into being through often historical conditions of inequality. And these justice narratives are regimented. They're regimented through regimes of appropriateness that take the place of sometimes direct sovereign state mechanisms, the absence of a police force, the absence of an age old judicial mechanism that, that establishes the prestige of, of the court. Uh, instead, the, the profound finding um, that much of my work has um, highlighted is that and as we can see on the slide, the figure of the victim, the figure of the perpetrator, and the notion of new democratically propelled uh, ideas of an international community uh, that demand that states are responsible, that demand that people be held accountable for um, perpetration of violence, uh, that, that actually the narrative around um, these things, victimhood, perpetration, the international community are actually part of the moral economy that's at play that is mobilizing what we understand as affective justice. And so seen through the remit of the International Criminal Court and its controversies, it's about the way that people come to understand, to challenge and influence legal orders through embodied affects, through interjections and social actions. These practices involved uh, are infinite. They span a whole range of everyday practices that could go from treaty drafting, ratification, adjudication, trial attendance, language negotiations, jo joking practices, refusals that involve rejections, withdrawals, non-cooperation, declarations, um, a, a, a range of counter campaigns that, that are at play. But what connects these practices are the embodied feelings and emotional expressions that drive such acts and circulate them globally. It is these practices that are at the heart of this notion of affective justice and that clarify the role of justice making in international criminal law. Now, the, the component parts, and it's always useful to take a look at the so the framing and in, in thinking about affective justice and and how we can make sense of law's power, it's to, to think about these three component parts as, as key to justice making in the contemporary period, and certainly as central to the international criminal assemblage, but in general um, that, that play out in, in contemporary international criminal law. Um, so legal technocratic practices, this involves a biopolitics of feeling, the, 
the centrality of, of course, the force of law, the role of technocratic tools in shaping and organizing and ordering black letter law, uh, in regulating the conditions of the possible uh, in, under which certain kinds of practices are rendered legitimate and legible and other practices illegitimate and criminal. Um, the, the next category, embodied affects, this has to do with the psychosocial, sometimes the pre-social responses that are constituted within the biological body. Uh, it's shaped by constellations of sensations, sometimes itinerant uh, manifestations, contingent sensations, all of these things are part of the, the embodiment of justice that is, part, is uh, central to the ways that these affectivities work. But, and third uh, is the emotional regimes. And I talk a lot about this throughout the book and in other places. Um, and the, the, the idea that what is acceptable is often regimented in particular ways. So that, that justice, the possibilities through which we understand something as justice is regimented through these cultural and social modalities uh, that, that organize the, the representational practices as something as appropriate. Uh, and, and we see this in, in a range of ways. Uh, and it, it takes its form in anti-impunity uh, mobilizations as well as in the kind of pushbacks, the, the, these reattributive acts in which people resist uh, anti-impunity formulations of, of the ICC as the, the basis for justice. Uh, and it, in many ways, if we think about these three component parts as central to effective justice and as a, a framework for thinking about the um, itineracy of, of justice and how it gets navigated in these complex ways, uh, some of the things that we see is that law itself is not a tool that creates justice in and of itself, that in fact it operates within unequal fields that go well beyond government, that go well beyond traditional forms of power, uh, and that, that embodiments are fundamentally embedded in social relations that can be deployed strategically uh, and often in unequal fields of power. And so how does this happen? Well, through the circulation of feeling expressions within those spaces, affective justice reflects embodiments of feelings that are manifest through discursive practices. And, and we see this in spoken word and legal actions, um, certainly in electronically mediated campaigns. We see this in social movements, especially in the contemporary period. What connects these practices are indeed these component parts, embodied feelings, emotional expressions, the regimes through which they, they operate and are seen as, um, as relevant and, and significant. And so how do we think about this then in relation to other theories of transnational justice? Um, well, uh, if, if I were to back up, some of the what I would suggest is that we think about the ways that notions of justice have tended to be mapped out against three broad categories of understanding. And those understandings are often philosophical, they're analytic, and then the third is practice oriented. And in the philosophical domain, certainly the work of uh, a range of scholars um, uh, Jacques Derrida has significantly influenced my work. We might think about some of the political theory out of John Rawls and a range of other um, scholars in which the, the philosophical questions of justice are shaped and established through notions of fairness, rights and, and duties, uh, or questions of the impossibility of, of justice at all if we return to Derrida. Um, but justice has also been understood analytically uh, that a range of scholars have understood it as a expressive domain through which people organize ideas about what is morally right, what is fair, what is ethical, therefore what is appropriate. It, it, the third then being practice, uh, when we understand justice in relation to practice, it's, it's seen as being produced and challenged by the materiality of people's actions through which meanings of justice are lived. And anthropologists have long engaged in documenting practice-oriented meaning-making. Uh, 
and how the, that have to do with the ways that the appropriateness and inappropriateness uh, of justice are produced um, through cultural behavior and are transformed even um, and, and as people dislodge meanings and make sense of other forms of meanings out of, out of justice. Uh, but practice oriented approaches have been less prominent in, in scholarly work on, on justice and in many ways anthropological work around the practice of justice um, is, is, has been emerging over the second half of the 20th century and in looking at international criminal law and international law in general, these sort of assemblages of, of justice making as it's playing out, um, what, adjusted, what effective justice seeks to redress then is the, cri criminal, the critical gap in theorizing international justice as actually a set of practices that are brought into being through both legal, political, these various forms of economic instrumentalism, yes, indeed, but also embodied uh, socio-moral expressions uh, that are part of the, the component parts that I've, that I've shown. And so what, what is the problem then? Well, in, maybe we can reflect on some of the influential scholarship of late over the last 20 years that um, has thought about the emergence of the judicialization of justice and uh, the, the relevance of humanity's law. And I turn to someone like Ruti Tetel's work, for example, because she's often cited in, in um, international affairs, in certainly international law and transnational tra transitional justice literature. And um, in, in her work, in the, in the article, Humanity's Law, Rule of Law for the New Global Politics, Patel argues that now more than ever, foreign policy decision-making occurs in the shadow of the law. By suggesting that the judicial paradigm shift is primarily discursive, she argues that the expansion of the international human rights system both enables and constrains politics and requires new interpretive principles through which to make sense of the present state of politics. And here, Titel argues that humanitarian discourses have produced the basis on which a larger set of interpretive pr principles are shaping global politics through a notion of humanity's law. But what she doesn't consider is the reality that an expanded international legal regime doesn't necessarily mean that those new interpretive principles form the practices that are actually transforming what justice is becoming in our world. While what is seen as a new international legalism is transforming state-centered law, what we see with approaches to effective justice is that it isn't, it isn't law in and of itself that produces the tools to implement what Titel refers to as law's reach or law's jurisdiction or personality or law's institutionalization. Rather, through an effective justice lens, we can see that law's humanity is actually propelled by international law's effective practices that are, that are mobilized by technocratic forms of law's force, uh, but that it draws its power through the, these moral economies that shape international law's buy-in. And, and let's take an example, as I try to wrap this up now, um, uh, I, let me turn to the Office of the Prosecutor, for example, um, uh, the Presidency and the Office of the Prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. They're constantly responding to these controversies by challenges uh, and challenges by shoring up and projecting the core logic of legal accountability as the sole and appropriate and objective strategy for ending impunity. In particular, the ICC routinely individualizes collective violence through the projection of the figure of the victim uh, in, in relation to the perpetrator and the, the perpetrator that caused that violence. The Gambian lead prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souta, has publicly asserted that the Rome Statute is, is in fact her Bible. And I quote, it's not about politics, but the law. Ben Suda explained um, this at, at a forum in Albany in 2012, when she was transitioning from deputy prosecutor to the lead prosecutor for the court. And here she said, quote, I will use the law to uphold justice. 
in emphasizing the end of quote, in emphasizing the court's mandate for justice, uh, that it centers on serving victims through legal accountability, she later argued, quote, we should not be guided by the words and propaganda of a few influential individuals whose sole aim is to evade justice, but rather we should focus on and listen to the millions of victims who continue to suffer from massive crimes. The return of our investment for what others may today consider to be a huge cost for justice is effective deterrence and saving millions of victims' lives." And, end quote. And so Herr Ben Suda's performative plea for ICC justice was certainly and it's constantly delivered in the name of vic the victim deploying what i call a, a sentimental legalism and and through this we see that her narrative invokes a mission of protecting victims against per powerful perpetrators who have indeed enjoyed impunity for too long but it's this discourse of saving victims by making high ranking perpetrators individually responsible through judicial trials in effect that, that links the notion of protection to the very particular application of legal justice. It serves as a sympathizing strategy that neatly collapses the protection of victims from the rejection of impunity for perpetrators. And that in, in effect reifies the legal tool of holding perpetrators accountable as the sole and appropriate mechanism for justice. It also regales a celebratory story of the rule of law operating through objectivity, predictability, and empowerment to end impunity, and ultimately to curb political violence. Now, as obvious and appealing as this may seem in the abstract, attempts to map this logic onto particular African contexts through legal actions have, of course, and many of you might note that this has ge generated profound disagreement, disease, and discord. Um, and, and has become manifest in various forms of pushbacks, the discourses of racial superiority, white superiority of um, the, the ICC um, having a race problem, et cetera, uh, the accusations of the ICC as racist, et cetera, emerge as uh, forms of, of everyday politics uh, for this, this institution. And of course, these, these claims are not um, unrelated to the, the questions about why the ICC uh, and why Africa. Uh, and so in part, the, the, the larger questions about affective justice, if we think about these technocratic forms, these embodied affects, the, the emotional regimes through which various pushbacks to the, the legality and not the politics of international law emerge, um, Part of what we see is that the, the conditions of the possible, the, the historical conditions in which some and not, not others are adjudicated, in which some are outside of the, the remit of the court, are outside of its jurisdiction, is deeply part of the ways that we understand justice, its legitimacy, its relevance, its, its legibility. And we, we see this playing out through what I call reattribution, this idea of a particular form of refusal, the pushback, the unwillingness to accept justice as articulated through, say, the ICC prosecutor, and to, to use other imaginaries, other narratives of justice, other um, regimes that affirm other conceptions of what justice should be. And in many ways it recall, it pushes us to think back to the opening that I started with the, in, in which the woman says, the day that you realize the, the conditions under which your father died uh, are the moments, are the, is the moment in which you become a man. And what that is a call to is to not look at the minutia of who did what, but in fact, to open up the, the contours of justice through which to, to think about the conditions of the possible. Um, and this is, of course, very, very difficult to do. And in, in the book, um, The Effective Justice, I talk through many instances in which we see that playing out, in which people reaffirm it. Um, reattribute justice using different re emotional regimes and, and different conceptualizations. 
So to, to wrap up then, um, the, the takeaway in, in many ways that I will, will leave you with today, and I'll just stop share because we probably don't need that. So the takeaway then that, that I'll, I'll leave you with in making sense of international justice certainly involves going beyond black letter law, but in thinking about the contingencies through which people navigate technologies, governance, discourses, uh, emotional regimes that, that legitimate meanings of justice. Um, what we see is that effective justice shapes how justice feels, how justice is manifest in the everyday, and how it, it is also decoupled uh, and relocated. So decoupled from place and relocated to new feeling spaces. Uh, so just as law, as we saw from the ICC prosecutors re refrain, um, that it's not about politics, it's about the law, just as law is also what people make of it, how they see it, and how its force or pronouncements feel, justice is also about the production of meaning in the context of these responses, emotional responses, bodily responses, the, the structures of possibility that shape one's social condition. But the processes of the production of law and justice are where the conflict lies. For not only are legal differences socially constituted, but they're also constituted by and within particular structures of inequality. These logics contribute to materialities of feeling and the domains within which they circulate and are rendered legible. And so emotional invocations of and responses to injustice then become the space for the materialization of other forms of justice. But their articulations are embedded in particular histories and power relations, providing the grammar through which social norms are instantiated and imaginaries are brought to life. It is through the reinforcements of emotional regimes, um, the, the idea, we the people, the international community, and the ways that those things get articulated, uh, which operate within particular frameworks of expectations that are propelled through various political and economic campaigns and, and that, that make justice manifest. And so it's, it's these processes that reconstitute the international publics even that, that shape further the, the moral economies through which justice takes shape. And so my concluding thoughts then dwell in the middle space of international of the international rule of law assemblage. This middle space is where the effective life of the law dwells, where alignments are made and others unraveled. Laws meanings and forms emerge from, the, from and constitute these emotional spaces, which are regimented, often regimented according to practices and aspirations of law's liberatory project. Law's possibilities are found in emotional, in these aspirations for social change, not in the core or not in its core instrumentality. And this is where key issues are about how we feel and what we do about how we feel and how these feelings, whether it's you know a court as a racist tool or a court as a continuation of uh, a colonial project or a court as an emancipatory beacon of hope, they're about determining the conditions under which law is deployed, with what institutions, under whose jurisdictions, and in which geographic spaces. For once we take on the core problem of justice and international justice as being effective, the reality that justice is not necessarily about the absence of injustice, but the diverse politics of mobilization we see that law's humanity is also always about something else. It's about the materialized practices that produce possibilities as well as displace them. This displacement of possibility can be tantamount to the displacement of peace and requires not only our political vigilance, but also our analytic consciousness through which to make sense of the complexities of power and its operationalization. I'll, I'll end on that note and uh, turn it over to you, uh, Catherine. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for that. So much provocative uh, food for thought. At this moment, I'd like to invite the panelists to turn their cameras back on. Um, we've reserved 15 minutes for Q&A just with the panelists in the series. Um, and I invite you all to
raise your virtual hand um, if you would like to be called on for this before we then open it up via Zoom chat for questions from the audience. So a lot to take in. Uh, Kate. So thank you so much, Kamari. That was wonderful. I've loved hearing you talk through the book, which I've also really loved and been so inspired by. Um, and I really appreciated seeing your analysis broken down in the chart that you showed us. Um, that was really helpful for me. And I'm wondering if you could um, speak a little bit about the role of politics, because you spoke so much about law and the kind of technocratic aspects of law. And I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about where politics fits in um, to this. Okay, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, I had a, a prompt there, so I pressed the button. Hopefully it was the right one <laughs> and I didn't disconnect us. Uh, so thank you for that question. Um, so where does politics fit in? Fit in? Well, as a, a legal anthropologist, it's worth me saying up front that in, in no way is politics separate from law, which is separate from the cultural, which is separate from the making of the everyday that even though Fatou Ben Souta in her articulation of law and politics makes a distinction, um, and we actually also see this debate underway in the, the piece, um, some of the, the piece um, questions before the international court, for, for example, the case in Uganda, et cetera, in which, um, legal thinkers insisted on a distinction between law and politics or law and peace or justice and peace. Uh, but, but fundamentally, analytically, there is no, they are all part of the same. They're part of an assemblage of interconnected entanglements that shape each other. The, the, and, and in fact, the, the, the argument that I would make is that we have to rethink the political, and this isn't new, uh, but the political constitutes and shapes that which becomes the norm, that which is, is deliberated, et cetera, that the political is about power. It's about the everyday deployment of, of practices, uh, but it's not unre unrelated to it. And I think that there is often a public and popular discourse that, that wants to push them separately. And we see the profound inclination for that uh, in among lawyers or prosecutors, et cetera, uh, because of the, the need to aspire for laws, laws objectivity and its distinct and its distinction from politics. But the, the, the political is the legal, that they are mutually. And I don't think so in no way does my analysis presume that that it would be useful to, to separate law and politics. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Uh, Anne Mishi, you have the next question. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for this really interesting talk. Um, so I, I was very interested in that, uh, in the slide that you showed with the picture of the, um, the victim, the perpetrator, and the international community as being part, all part of this moral economy and kind of tied up, and as you're talking about, as this uh, assemblage. And I'm a, a sociologist who studies social movement, so I'm interested if you could to hear you talk more about the role of um, social movements, whether it's local, you know, whether civil society or more contentious mobilizations or transnational um, movements. Um, what role social movements play in advocating for justice, possibly sometimes redefining justice, um, sometimes because they're caught up in the moral economy that you've described reinforcing injustice um and I'm, I'm thinking like for example when we've seen in the black lives matter and the the defund the police the prison um, abolition movement we've seen real challenges um from to define actually the terms under which we understand justice coming from social movements so you know how do you see the role of social movements as advocates as challengers and possibly as reinforcers Great, thanks for that. Um, so I, I, I write a lot about social movements and the role of technology. And in Effective Justice, there are a couple of chapters in which I look at the Bring Back Our Girls campaign, as well as 
another set of campaigns, Coney 2012, and, um, and another campaign that led to the election of uh, the, the current president and deputy president of Kenya, uh, Kenyatta and Ruto. Uh, and, and so it's, it's tremendous as a way to think, of, social movements are tremendous as a way to think about the contemporary moment and digitization, uh, the GoFundMe mechanisms, many of these electronic mechanisms are key to thinking about the mobilization of the category of the victim, the category of the perpetrator, and the most profound being the emergence of an international community that can demand its it, and produce a constituency that um, outside of a state and the, the kind of the, the realm of citizenship that we've come to understand, um, we have the, the mobilization of a unit that is often constituting itself as the international community that with a, alongside, you know, need to know movements and around the missing or uh, alongside um, R2P, the responsibility to protect, we see the, the profound mobilization of these um, international community mechanisms. And, and analytically, what um, I'm neither interested in celebrating them nor in um, critiquing them, but instead, and I, I know you're not either, but just to be clear, what's profoundly interesting, uh, I think analytically, is the, the way that new technologies are mediating and producing the international community as a proxy victim. And so what we have are no longer is the image of the disheveled girl or the, the perpetrator that I showed in the image, no longer is um, in international criminal justice circles, is that the only mobilizing domain through which to produce a moral economy. Instead, there are new, there's a new language and the technology facilitates a different kind of circulation that uh, produces proxy victims in which the, the notion of the international community come to constitute uh, proxy victims. Um, and I think that this is an interesting manifestation, um, a, an interesting way to think about harm, but also an interesting way of making sense of contemporary democracies and the, these kind of global transnational alliances. There's a lot more work to be done around transnational technologies. One of the projects I'm involved now with, um, it, it's a three-year study on geospatial technologies and cellular phone, um, the use of thinking about these warning signals and, and um, the way that social movements are mobilizing beyond governments, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere, uh, to take command and, and mobilize to, to produce the effect that they need in order to, whether it's to gain accountability for those who have caused violence or to find the missing and loved ones. Uh, but technology and the possibilities that, that are at play, I think, are, are quite profound. And so social movements is, is key to, to making sense of the assemblage as it's manifest here in the contemporary moment. And I think that we need a lot more work around these questions. So hopefully that, that answered uh, the intention of the question. A terrific question. I love this idea of exploring proxy victims as well. Uh, Julia, next question. Um, um, so I, I think this is a question that actually builds quite organically on Anne and Kate. Um, but I, I wanted to come back to your discussion of law as a kind of technocracy and thinking about how affective justice is an analytic category that not only helps us rethink law, but also helps us rethink technocracy and technocratic action. Um, and I'm struck because often in earlier anthropological critiques of development and transnational legal processes, I feel like as anthropologists, we often use this word technocratic as a way to suggest that a process has been stripped of political or moral content. And I'm really struck by the extent to which your model allows us to see that technocratic practices are also saturated um, with emotion and with moral valences. And I, so I, um, I have sort of two questions that come out of that excitement. One of them is, how does that shift what we pay attention to in the field when we seek to think about the effects of technocracy, what counts as technocratic versus other domains of, of social intervention on one hand? 
And on the other hand, I'm curious if you think, you know, this earlier analysis of technocracy as depoliticizing or um, as, as amoral, um, were we getting it wrong? <laughs> Or is this something special that has to do with the fact that increasingly it's law that provides technocratic tools? Like we're not talking about agricultural development projects anymore. We're not talking about the green revolution. We're not even really talking about financialization. We're talking about the law as a technocratic tool. So thank you so much. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. What a great question for pushing me on clarifying these technocratic domains. And, and of course, um, in the spirit of Deleuzian assemblage theory, the, 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 the assemblage that interests me in that book and in that work was the international criminal law assemblage. And so, um, and, and what that means when you unpack it. Uh, and so of course law becomes central, but What's also central is the the components of the law that go missing. Uh, and so what do we miss? I guess is the first question when we focus or think through these technocratic formations. It is law, but it's also the, the, the technocratic formations are imbued with notions of supremacy. They're imbued with what counts, what's important. And so in some of my other work, I write about um, you know, how it is, how, how should we be thinking about the all African indictments by the court? And in part, what I, what I argue is that it's not so much that the court itself is racist. The question that we ought to be asking is, what are the, 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 the legal technocratic frameworks that allowed certain crimes to be central and deemed the most important crimes to humanity and not other crimes? Why not drug, drug trafficking? Why not extractive mineral dumping? Why not some of the environmental questions? Why not the questions that actually led to violence in the first place, the extractivism, um, piracy, um, etc. These are all crimes that then get introduced later in the African court, um, the, the, the 14 crimes, which are economic crimes. Why is it that they are, that the technocratic production of legality led to conditions in which particular states and actors were outside of the remit of criminality and those within the remit were within the remit for particular historical and contextual reasons. And so the technocratic questions and legality are also about a whole set of other things. Colonial histories and how it is after independence that these political and economic markets continued to be dominated and fueled, which then later led to the kind of pilfering that we saw with in Sierra Leone and elsewhere with diamonds, with uh, radon, with um, uh, a, a range of minerals and that these extract, extractive industries are part and parcel of the conditions of the possible. So technocratic conditions of po possibility are critical for me in thinking about what the law enables, but it, it means when we rethink the political that we also think about how some crimes and not others, what are the processes through which this happens? What, what are the geographies in which that is possible? What, what temporalities allow some to be outside of the remit of jurisdiction and others not? And, and so it's those processes of formulation that are, are I think, critical that, and, and often we don't ask, the, the question that gets asked is a different question. Uh, and so, and I think it's a useful one and contemporary movements certainly are starting to ask more and more of these questions around the, the conceptualization of, of justice. So hopefully that starts to, to answer. Um, and your second question, I guess, law provides technocratic tools. Do, um, have I answered it or do you want to just push further? I, well, I, I know I asked a two-part question, which is a little bit holding up um, air time. So I don't want to take up uh, too much time if other folks have questions, but if they don't, I, I can reframe it. So essentially we're in our space for audience questions and I'm okay. waiting for Q&A to 
roll in. I, I have one question so far, but uh, Julie, we can pick it up at the end um, if you're interested. Okay, um, so I don't know if you all can see the Q&A. Um, so uh, Joanna Nakabita, thanks to Professor Clark, and she says she's been studying R2P um, and many Africans in her class felt that it was inconsequential because the international system itself is based on supremacy and power. Aren't these interventions and votes on various resolutions a function of power and national interests, especially in resource rich African countries? And how do we influence this real politic as peace practitioners? Uh, so how do we influence this? Uh, maybe I should take a look at the question. Is it written in the chat? So how do we influence R2P? It's written in the chat. Yeah, so she's asking this question from the perspective of our students in the, um, the master's program in global affairs with a focus in peace studies, which attracts peace practitioners. You know, how do we how do we kind of influence real politic in a practical way as opposed to thinking theoretically about technocracies. Great, okay. Um, yeah, and I thank you for the, for the question. Um, I guess th there's a time for everything. There's a time for conceptual rethinking. There's a time for the application of the law as we have it. There's a time for forward-looking uh, work, forward-looking practices. And one of the, I think one of the first steps is to, to not assume that the temporality of justice is a five minute fix where you sign a petition and you've done your job. Um, certainly you're not talking about that, but I think that's often the first place to start, especially with young people who presume that the, the nature of change can be mobilized around the signing of petitions and using the tools that already exist. One of the things that conceptual work and political work has shown us is that in many ways, we have to redefine the question um, and our tools are insufficient. They continue to be insufficient. Our legal conceptions, um, the, the limits and possibilities uh, are, we also need to rethink, but the, the key is reckoning with at what time, through what tools are certain effects possible. Um, so for example, one of the work, one of the things that I've been working on through in, the African Union has been with the, the legal division as a technical advisor. Um, and our team over the last five years has been working on putting in place the provisions as well as the rules of, of procedure and evidence for an African court. But an African court with particular, that includes particular crimes that are actual economic crimes that have to do with toxic dumping, that have to do with the kind of crimes that are of concern, but, but also alongside that mechanism, other mechanisms through which to think about restructuring the political. So, you, you know, when there are decimated legal systems, what are the mechanisms that are needed? When there are land redistribution questions, what are the long-term mechanisms that are needed in order for that to happen? Um, and ensuring that there are networks in advance and, and ways of rethinking and reconceiving uh, these modalities. And so I think the, the first point is to recognize what are the tools that we have. The, it, the, the second is to recognize the, the strength and the weaknesses of those tools. The third is to deploy the tools that we can for the effects that we hope that they will achieve. Um, but the fourth is really to aspire to um, new tools, new rules, new ways of conceiving on a different future where we can address some of the political foundations of violence in the first place. And that is the long durée. That involves reconceptualizations. It involves these academic questions, but it, but, and it involves collaborative work with a range of players, which is a longer term. Uh, commitment, but it really is thinking about where one is in the process. What are the tools that are available, short term, long term, um, and what's one's commitment? And and so there's no one easy answer to that question, but it in many ways depends on, you know, where one is positioned and what the what is available to us. What questions are we asking, and what's informing the work that we're doing? So hopefully that framework is um, 
is, is a start for continuing to think about perhaps some of the things that you're already thinking through as you work on some of the challenges with R2P and its its deployment, its problematic deployment at times. Uh, but I think that's part of a much longer conversation. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from the audience, which came before um, our panelists, and it's from Susan Schepler, who's a visiting fellow at Notre Dame this year, who thanks you for the excellent talk. And she says, I was thinking that from the perspective of a Sierra Leonean, for example, the addition of international justice is an addition to an already crowded justice marketplace. Um, and each has its own different embodied effective practices. Um, just one, uh, one, another sovereignty amongst many. And so analytically, um, how do you think about hierarchy amongst justice mechanisms, or do you think about hierarchy among justice mechanisms? Good, all right, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, uh, especially with as assemblage theory, how do we think about hierarchy? And of, of course, on one hand, conceptually and intellectually, I want to insist that in fact, hierarchies aren't, um, hierarchies might help us to think about what is the most pronounced in a given context, but it doesn't necessarily think about how, allow us to think about how things are interconnected. So on one hand, one might assume that international criminal justice with its millions and millions of, of dollars deployed to hiring, you know, cosmopolitan lawyers and judges, et cetera, is profoundly reshaping our world. On the other hand, millions of people don't buy into the mechanism, might not think that it's the viable solution for dealing with the, the lack of water around the corner or the fact that they're recovering from post-election violence and still have a bullet in their back. Um, that you know, whether there's an adjudicatory victory at, at a court is irrelevant to their everyday life and the aspiration to send their kids to school and to feed them and to clothe them. Um, does, how does the hierarchy, a hierarchy doesn't really allow us to think about someone positioned differently, um, but what it what allows us to do that is the interconnectedness of these relations that an indictment might have an impact on someone who might not fully buy into, you know, an international criminal mechanism, uh, but it, it might have a different kind of impact or an adverse impact. And so what I would suggest is that we not get um, sucked into the, the idea that international criminal justice is the supreme form of justice making, that it's at the height and pinnacle of judicial possibilities, but instead that we think about the, the ways that it is connected within an assemblage of a whole range of other things, including other possibilities and other dispositions. And thinking about that rhizomatically or thinking about that, that interconnection allows us to also undo that hierarchy and to conceive of other possibilities. Uh, and I think that that's important intellectually as well uh, to, to suspend the, the inclination to presume that criminal justice or political, the, the UN and these mechanisms are at the top of the hierarchy, when in fact, uh, there are other ways of conceiving of this interconnection. Fantastic. So we have three questions from the panelists and five minutes left. Um, and so I'm going to ask the panelists if they could ask a quick iteration of their question one after the other and Dr. Clark can perhaps tackle all of them simultaneously. Um, so Laura, if you would like to go first and then Lori and then Alyssa, please go ahead and ask your questions. I'll try to be really quick. Just wanted to thank you for such a fabulous talk and a wonderful framing. Um, what I was thinking about during your talk uh, was really the question of what the law hears uh, and what the law doesn't hear. Um, and in particular, I this idea of embodied affects and emotional regimes being part of your framing of effective justice, how does that, how can you, talk about how that reframes what evidence is 
uh, within these courts. Um, it was a, it was definitely and, and, and particularly in terms of um, different understandings of materiality that may not be uh, just discursive. Uh, Dr. Clark, thank you uh, very much for your input. I was interested in how different forum and institutions attempt to resolve the contestation around international justice, and you've partly addressed that. So these issues are, are contested and resolved to a greater or lesser extent in domestic courts, in international courts, regional courts, in national parliaments, um, in the UN at the level of, of policy and discourse. And they're also resolved to a greater or lesser extent in negotiating forums as countries move from war to peace, where those negotiating forums end up rewriting the rules of society and address questions of justice, structural, personal, transitional justice in ways that have profound and far reaching impact on that society. I'm interested in, in whether your work has covered that arena of contestation and resolution of uh, dilemmas around international criminal justice. Um, thank you, Dr. Clark, for sharing your work with us. I was wondering if you could say something about how different like affective justice assemblages might interact with one another in a sort of mediating type of way and how this might tell us something about like the different ways certain emotions are imbued with more political power than others. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you for those. So I'll, I'll take the three uh, all at once. Um, why don't I start with the last question then? So how do different affective justice mechanisms uh, interrelate? Um, maybe I'll, I'll answer that by giving an example and then uh, talking about what I see as the connection. Now, I like the Kenyan example in thinking about the complexities of affectivities because Kenyatta, so, um, so in 2007, 2008, uh, Jomo Kenyatta won the, there, there was post-election violence in, in Kenya. Uh, the International Criminal Court some three or four years later uh, released uh, arrest warrants uh, identifying six people that were deemed most criminally responsible. And one of them was Jomo Kenyatta, um, Jomo, Uhuru Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta's son. Now, what's interesting about this configuration is that Jomo Kenyatta was an independent figure. He was jailed by the British government. There was a social movement that led to his release. Upon his release, he led the country into independence and independence talks in Kenya with uh, the former um, imperial power, the United Kingdom at the time. And Jomo Kenyatta, became a, a, a figure, uh, a freedom fighter, right? Reframed as a freedom fighter and the Kenyatta family profoundly influential in the making of the new nation state in, in Kenya. Some 50 years fast forward, the, the very same, the, the issues of violence um, over a hundred years of colonial imposition, uh, became manifest, of course, in 2007, 2008, when um, we saw the, igni the igniting of violence that was not unrelated to earlier colonial uh, uh, land displacement and the production of refugees in the region and ethnic turmoil. Now, fast forward, uh, we have the indictment of Uhuru Kenyatta, Jomo Kenyatta's son, and Jomo Kenyatta, of course, part of, you know, a different kind of, um, I guess, mafia, as it were, or, um, and in that manifestation, you, you have these two figures, two different and distinct courts, 
yet the emotional regime around which Uhuru Kenyatta mobilized support so that he could become the next president of the country because he wasn't the president then was to referentially index his father and the colonial courts and the imprisonment of his father by simply using a, a regime of the colonial other, right? And invoking um, the, the term, we've seen this before. And that at referential index back to a colonial history was a powerful trope through which to think about the contemporary period which is unrelated and related, right? That it's related to dispossession of land, et cetera, the violence is fundamentally related to the colonial project and in imperial quest and um, extraction of land, but it's not necessarily related to the everyday violence that occurred in the moment of 2000, you know, the decisions that were made around death uh, in that moment, yet, the, the regimes, the emotional regimes, the, 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 the histories that are called on are all interconnected. Um, and what matters isn't the accuracy of that history and the, the referentiality and how, whether it's accurate and how it's accurate. It is that it makes possible an emotional alliance that is feasible for a moment. And in its feasibility produces the domain of, for support in which certain discourses become viable and usable and mobilized as, as profoundly potent in, in the support of uh, Kenyatta in you know, the new instantiation in the 2000s. And so these, these different mechanisms play out in different ways. Temporality is off, the, the structure of legality is off, many things are off, but what is constant is a feeling of dispossession a, a feeling of displacement, um, injustice, etc., um, and so these, so much of the, so in the book, one of the the mappings has to do with how we make sense of that entanglement, and that we can't disaggregate it, but at the same time we can demand questions of the the use of this imagery and the way that the regime operates can can operate um, beneficially for someone who may or may not be guilty. Um, okay, so that's that question. The the next, how much time do we have? Um, if you could do it in two minutes, that would be optimal. <laughs> um, so the question, how does the law, um, what does the law hear and what doesn't it hear? And how might we think about the materiality of affect uh, when in, in the context of evidence, another form of materiality. Um, and what does that do? What does that do for us? Now, I think in, in the question, we can presume that, that, that maybe the, the person who asked the question wants to insist that there's something different about the materiality of evidence that is a physical thing, like a, a wound in the body, a pain in the heart, um, a death of a corpse, the, the existence of a corpse, etc. that this evidence is may or may not be part of a, a hierarchy uh, that's different from other forms of evidence. Um, if I have the question right, um, if I if I understand the, the 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 assumptions of the question, I mean what I would say is that the material evidence is the same as the the kind of imaginaries that allow us to see and make sense of that evidence that that they're all inter they're fundamentally interrelated so to to see a corpse or to um to witness to bear witness to something um is interrelated with the kind of bodily response that one would have in the context of that evidence um and so it's not unrelated at at, at all, but I think that the question, what the law hears and doesn't hear, is an interesting one because often the, the presumption is that sight, we privilege sight, it's what the law sees. Um, and what we're what we're willing to hear through maybe vocal responses, et cetera, may be very different. Um, 
Okay, so in that time, I can't really do justice to answering that question, but it's perhaps something that I'll continue to think about, and it would help to have some some back and forth on on that as well. But the relation between what the law hears and what the law sees, and what that connection is to materiality, uh, as well as the very real material responses that we have in courts, is is interrelated. But but perhaps I can say more about that um, at the end if. If we want to talk, oh, we yes, we are we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for your your incisive talk, your thoughtful answers to the questions. Thank you also to the panelists for participating today. And for this, I will turn it over to Julia Kowalski for a final word. Uh, wonderful. Thanks. Thanks so much. So this is the final concluding event in our series, Mediating Justice. And as a result, I, it falls to me to rapidly thank a very large number of people, um, starting with Professor Clark. Thank you so much for taking the time to unfold your recent work for us in this context. And thanks to Kat for, for moderating today's um, somewhat unusual and creative uh, conversation. Um, I'd like to also thank all of our dialogue participants, Lori, Alyssa, Laura, Will, and Mahan, as well as participants who could not join us today, David Hooker, Justin DeLeon, and Samina Mullah. Thanks to our audience members for your, for your questions, and a huge thank you on behalf of myself and Catherine Martineau to the Kroc Institute for Peace Studies for their support of this series. Um, and in particular, thanks to the Kroc Institute staff. This series has relied on all of us learning how to use new tools for connecting with colleagues and sharing scholarship virtually and remotely. And a huge and um, very special thank you goes out to Lisa Gallagher and Hannah Heinziker for their support and their very able organizing skills and to Asher Kroffman for agreeing to host the series at Kroc in the first place. So our opening event, six video dialogues between some of the panelists you heard from today, um, as well as eventually this event are all on a landing page that I have shared with you um, in the chat if you're curious to learn more. Again, thank you so much um, to the Kroc Institute and to Professor Clark and to our dialogue participants.